Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dana Marsh. I'm director of the Indiana University Jacobs School of Music Historical Performance Institute. We're delighted again to be able to present to you this very special tribute to the bad boy of the bassoon, Mr. Michael McCraw. This is part two of that offering and we're glad that you could join us. Professor McCraw had an affiliation with the school here for more than 15 years and served a rather substantial stint as director of the Early Music Institute, during which time he put on very inspired projects, uh, raised a good deal of money, and uh, really uh, produced some incredible offerings, which many of his students will still remember. You'll get to hear from his colleagues and close friends and students over the years. So please do sit back and join us uh, for part two of this tribute to Michael McCraw. So what were you, you were thinking about um, Class classical performance practice. He class. taught classical performance mm -hmm. practice. Oh, performance pra he taught classical performance practice. He had it even been taught no, before him? It he, hasn't. He no, he's the first made person who added yeah. because before that it had been medieval yeah. and Renaissance, Renaissance, Renaissance yeah. Baroque, yeah. and then it's yeah, yeah. kind of stopped. And That's he right. was so pulling he, us forward. Yeah, he, he was curriculum. really important to that. And, and the reviews were, I mean, I got to see them because I was chair, and, and the students were always inspired by his, um, his classes. Nice. And I think it's nice. also interesting to sort of think about his colorful dramatic personality, but in terms of his teaching, even when he did a, a presentation in 205 hour, with what we used to call colloquium, um, 205 hour, he, he talked about intonation and he, would, he was so organized and particularly demanding, but he'd explain everything very, very clearly. He was super organized with the delivery and um, he managed to get every single instrumentalist in that classical performance practice to perform. Mm -hmm. I had a number of keyboardists who were taking that class and they got a lot from him but so it was like his his brain when he wanted to be focused and compartmentalized and really attentive to detail and and very professorial in his way he could be but then the other side of him which was just outlandishly colorful and beyond any boundaries yeah. beyond containment i have quite a few memories but what really stands out for me when i think of michael is his love of storytelling. Sometimes in the breaks when I was teaching harpsichord at IU, I would hear a knock on my door thinking it was a student and in walked Michael full of many tales to tell me and he would always bring a smile to my face and he often made me laugh. I was really moved by the fact that Michael just seemed to fearlessly be himself and it has inspired me as an artist and as a musician. I met Michael McCraw in 1983 when I moved to Cologne, Germany. And um, we were just kindred spirits from the start. It uh, was one of the most remarkable friendships I've ever had in my life. Um, he was joyful and witty engaging and when it came to his music he was really serious and really good. I met Michael when we were assigned to play together in a woodwind quintet at the North Carolina School of the Arts. We became good friends and we stayed in touch even after we both moved north to separate cities. I was in Philadelphia and he was in New York. But when I told him that I wanted to move to New York, he was very helpful in suggesting a path by uh, becoming involved with the City University of New York that enabled me to move here. And after I did, he was very generous introducing me to his circle of musical friends, taking me to people's apartments to play trio sonatas, taking me to concerts at the City University where he was teaching and where I heard the viola da gamba for the first time in my life, and forcing me to play hot to tear duets with him at a time when I had not the slightest clue 
what to do with early 18th century French repertoire. I studied Baroque bassoon with Michael in 1998 to 2000, and Michael was an incredibly influential teacher for me. He really changed the way I looked at Baroque music, he encouraged me to be expressive, to loosen the music, to make it come to life, to be free, but not too free. I remember I was working on ornamentation and decided to put a bunch of ornaments in a piece and present it to Michael. He listened to it and said, you must always be sure that when you add ornamentation to the piece, it improves the piece. So I took most of it back out. I continued to play the Baroque bassoon, thanks to Michael, and I continued to be inspired by his recordings. I just try to keep his sound in my head. Michael could talk to anybody, draw you into serious or lightheaded discussions, tell one hilarious story after the other in three languages, and tell you about his much beloved friends around the world. He was best friends with Washington McLean, with whom he had been in the woodwind section of Tafelmusik. Together, they, got, they were very fascinating to be with because they were such opposites of each other. Michael, extrovert, was introvert. Michael, speaking four languages, was surprising Tafelmusik on tour in Greece that he never had mentioned that he spoke Greek. At our summer seminars, the faculty would stay at our house. Michael would cook exquisite dinner and Wash would, with everybody talking around him, sit in the corner on the deck reading a book. Once Wash told me that as a kid he practiced the oboe while he and his family watched TV. But Wash quietly watched all of us, thought intensely about everybody and shared his deep insights. The last time we saw each other in 2013, he told me that he was very worried about Michael. He thought that Michael was considering to stop playing the bassoon. They had made plans to make one more recording together and had talked about the repertory every time Bosch was in town. But for some time, Michael hadn't mentioned the plans again and this worried Bosch deeply. He knew that abandoning the bassoon would be extremely difficult for Michael. Michael had this truly unique capacity to draw people in, to make people comfortable, to give people a good time. I was in awe to see that capacity displayed at each of the three nursing homes that he lived in after the accident. In the last home, in 2017, he told me that he was aware that every time he was moved to another home, the home standard of living went down as well. But true to himself, at my last visit with him in 2018, he again tried to draw the patients with whom he shared the dinner table into the conversation. He was always in good spirits when I was with him. He was equally eager for the smoking sessions outside with the other patients as he had enjoyed the smoking sessions with students and faculty outside the School of Music. During the visits, he enjoyed playing recorded duets played virtuoso passages of recorded concertos by heart and sung the themes of multiple works for the bassoon while talking about repertory. The joy of music and of company was so deeply ingrained in him that it never left him. It was a beautiful gift that enriched all around him. <laughs> Oh, 
the Early Music Institute from 2008 to 2009. Um, I had first met Michael a few years before that. Um, I attended the Topple Music Baroque Summer Institute. And at that point in my life, I was in the midst of getting my doctorate in modern bassoon. I had just picked up the Baroque bassoon. And I really wasn't sure what the whole early music thing was all about. So I was going to Toronto to try to figure out if if this was something that I wanted to pursue. And I think within the first day, maybe two, after getting to know Michael just the littlest bit and hearing him play and experiencing his approach to, to music making, um, I was pretty much sold. So after completing my doctorate, I went to IU to study with him for just one year. And I always wished that I had more time with him. Um, as a student of his, I felt constantly inspired constantly motivated to do my best. Every time I had the opportunity to play for Michael, I felt like I wanted to, to bring my very best to the table. He was also the type of teacher that asked lots of questions and was always asking the why behind what we were doing. And especially in the area of historical performance, that's so important. Um, and so now as a teacher myself, these are some of, some of the things that I always look to that I remember as being such such um, elements of, of my learning that helped to shape me and I hope to pass that down to my own students. So Michael was one of the few artists and mentors that really really influenced my life. He was the first one that told me I should play early clarinet and for that I'm very very grateful just he was what you see is what you get no games no playing one of the best human beings i've ever met in my life michael is with me um through every clarinet lesson that i teach um i'm honored to pass on his legacy he was a legend i loved him dearly 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 and um I miss him. I miss him very much, but I'm very honored to continue um, to continue his legacy and pass it on to the future generations of clarinet players and musicians in general. I studied at IU from 2004 to 2008. Um, I was thinking about what Michael's story I wanted to share with you, and I have some fairly colorful ones, as I'm sure most of us do, but um, the one that keeps coming back into my mind is um, my first year at IU, I was basically still a beginner on the Baroque oboe, and I was having a chamber music coaching with Michael, and I was squeaking and squawking a lot, as young Baroque oboists do, and Michael was obviously starting to get pretty annoyed with it. so. He said, you know, when I lived in Germany, I had this colleague, this illustrious colleague who never squeaked and his students also never squeaked or squawked. And so I said to him, tell me, how is it that you teach your students? What do you say to them to teach them to stop squeaking and squawking? And my colleague said to me, I don't know. I tell them to stop squeaking. So Michael looks at me and sort of does this thing with his eyes that he was known for doing and says, so stop squawking. And wouldn't you know it, it worked. I met Michael in 2003 when I transferred to Bloomington after I attended BPI that summer. I had just worked with the late Jim Bolliard who encouraged me to take lessons with Michael when I, when I got there. So when I built up the courage to email Michael and ask him if, if I could take lessons with him, it just, it still amazed me when he told me he'd be happy to have me in his studio. This completely blew my mind because here was this guy, a brilliant musician who I'd come to admire so much from recordings, and then to find out that 
he's also a genuinely nice guy. He was such a great spirit in the musical world with everybody he came into contact with. Cheers to Michael. Hey Michael, I was actually reading through some past emails and um, one of the last ones that you wrote had addressed me as, hey babe, my little grasshopper. Um, and then of course the email had all like responses to musical updates and love life updates and things like that and um, and you signed it your dad question mark question mark uncle question mark question mark and um, you know I think it was really indicative of the kind of relationship we had I mean you were like a both musical dad and musical crazy uncle <laughs> presence in my life um, and I remember you know, every time I shared a crazy dating story or shared about a boyfriend and you would ask, is he appropriately gorgeous? And um, you never got to meet my husband, but he is appropriately gorgeous. And just thank you for all those great memories and great times that we had, even after I moved to Chicago. And I know that you and Wash are playing music somewhere in the ether together and, you know, you always be remembered and loved and missed. I miss Michael very, very much. Um, I am forever grateful that he was a part of my life and took me under his wing, teaching me about life, about music, and how to be a great teacher. I wouldn't be the musician uh, that I am today had it not been for Michael. Godspeed, Michael. Well, Rachel, it's your old friend and colleague, Michael McCall, just calling to say hello and see how you are. Oh, well, and tell you something I read today. My favorite quote from uh, Mae West. I used to be Snow White. Now I have drifted. And my favorite quote from Dolly Parton. You can't imagine how expensive it is to look this cheap. But I always say, you can't imagine how cheap it is to look this fabulous. Okay, that was it for now, Rachel, and I hope you're well. Bye-bye.